Hello, and welcome to another in the Huddersfield Local History Society's series of talks for the 2021-2022 season. Today our speaker is Lewis Allen. Lewis is currently Senior Pastor at Hope Church here in Huddersfield. With his family, he came to Huddersfield from London more than 10 years ago. What he's going to talk about is Huddersfield's 18th century vicar, the Reverend Henry Van. He's the subject of Lewis's ongoing research for a PhD at Oxford, but also, as you might imagine, a personal and professional interest. Van was a man whose reputation and influence in his lifetime stretched far beyond Huddersfield. He was an influential figure in the revival of, the, of Protestant Christianity in Britain in the 18th and early 19th centuries, and was a colleague and friend of many of its major figures, including John Wesley and George Whitfield. Arguably, although remaining an Anglican himself, he could be said to have been a major figure in creating the Methodist Church, which became so strong in this part of the world. After he left Huddersfield, he continued to be a leading figure in the evangelical movement and through his writing and personal contacts, helped to shape the thinking of many Christians, even helping shape the early career of William Wilberforce and of course, the anti-slavery movement. Lewis. Hello, my name is Lewis Allen and I'm speaking to you today under the title Fired with Love Unfeigned, the life and labours of the Reverend Henry Venn, Vicar of St Peter's Church, Huddersfield, 1759 to 1771. Henry Venn. Here's in our picture, a picture of Henry Venn, where Venn sat for the artist when Venn was in his early 40s. Who was it that the artist was painting? What impressions would he have got from Venn? Venn was a person who today we would say had great emotional intelligence. He had a skill in reading people and getting alongside them. He was a man of uh, a real skill and a commitment in friendship. Many of his friends he had known as he got on in life for many decades and was very popular with fellow clergy and with his parishioners. He was deeply devoted to his family. He gave himself as being a mentor and an encourager to several generations of younger men passing through his care into Christian ministry. He was prodigiously generous. One of his elderly parishioners, uh, looking back over many years, spoke of his preaching and said that and I'm quoting him, when he got warm to his subject, he looked as if he would jump out of the pulpit. So with all of this kindness and generosity, he was a man who was deeply committed to his Christian convictions. In fact, as we'll discover, it was those convictions which shaped the way he related to others. And his best known ministerial years are in Huddersfield. So here's a picture of 18th century Huddersfield. Not a big place at that stage, not an important, significant place, but a town and a district with an increasing reputation for its textile industry and uh, a place on the eve of an industrial revolution. Of course, at that time, textile work was done in houses, in households, and there would be a, an astonishing change in many of those households in the town, in the region, as Venn was promoting his religion and being one of the key leaders in what is known as the 18th century revival of religion. And Venn's work would lead, leave a stamp for years and decades to come. Let's trace his story as it begins in London, where he was born. Here's a picture of St Antonin's Church in the heart of the City of London, where Venn's father Richard was the incumbent. Richard was a, a, a stern, a rather severe, but a loving man. And Henry Venn was very much a child in the stamp of his father, serious and principled. What of the religion 
of the day and of the National Church. Now let's look for a moment at uh, William Hogarth's print of entitled The Sleeping Congregation. Now, I know that you can't see all the details of the 1736 print, but we can certainly pick out some. So we have the clergyman in the pulpit. He's preaching on the text from the Gospels where Christ says, Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Well, inadvertently, the parson is doing just that. The congregation is resting. They're asleep. He has lulled them to sleep and nothing and nobody is waking them up, certainly not talk of religion. But with their slumbering ease, if you notice the clerk who is in the lower at the lower reading desk, he is looking over or is he leering over his shoulder at the young woman to his left. And so Hogarth is criticising the church. It has nothing to say, nothing to wake up and rouse its congregants. And he's more than hinting that the church has traces of hypocrisy and immorality. So a church, perhaps with not so much going on in the way of vital religion. But here is a famous Yorkshireman, John Tillotson from Sorby Bridge, who rose through a glittering career at Cambridge and who was archbishop at the end of the 17th century. He was a very popular man and a very popular preacher. And his sermons were preached word for word in pulpits up and down the land in the early 18th century as Venn was growing up. And Tillotson's message in essence was this, well, God accepts you when you give him your best. Do your best and all shall be well. And that's a popular message because that's an easy, it's a, it's a doable message, or so most people think. But many more sensitive or thoughtful folks weren't so sure. What is the best? And will God really accept our best? Really? And can we be sure of that? What about our worst, our sins and shortcomings? What does God think of them? And anyway, hasn't Christianity got a lot to do with being saved and rescued from God's wrath? These questions are stuck in the minds of many and increasingly found their place in Henry Venn's mind. Well, in 1742, we see Venn going off to Cambridge University and he was there a very popular student he was very bright. He won a scholarship during the course of his studies. He was a great cricketer. But increasingly, Ben found himself in soul trouble. He would swap the company of friends for lonely walks as he prayed and reflected. He would read his Bible. He was troubled, but he hadn't found any answers. Like his father, he was ordained. That happened in 1747. Two years later, he took up a fellowship at another Cambridge college and he began a curacy just outside the city where he was a very conscientious worker for the good of his parishioners. Now, by this time, the end of the 1740s, a young, known as a boy preacher, an ordained man, George Whitfield, had been taking London by storm for a good decade or so. Here's a picture of him preaching in a part of London, an open space in Kennington, south of the river called Moorfields. And we know that on many occasions, Whitfield would preach to crowds upwards of 10,000 and sometimes even double that number. And we have eyewitness assurances that his gifts of oratory were so prolific that he could be heard and understood by crowds of many, many thousands. He was young. He was insecure, he was brash, he was a bit of a show off. There were aspects of his ministry and his behavior which he later regretted and repented of. But there was no doubting of his utter sincerity as he sought to share his Christian convictions. London clergymen closed their pulpits to him and actually Venn's father was the first London clergyman to do that. Whitfield and others after him 
took to the open spaces to preach to the masses. Notice some of the things going on in this picture. You have drummers drumming to drown out Whitfield's preaching. You have a trumpeter top left in the tree. You have two actors recognized by their costumes who are particularly opposed to Whitfield and the compliment was returned. And one of them is trying to reach Whitfield with a whip. There are men, women, babes in arms, some scoffing, some thinking, some ardent, ardently devoted to Whitfield. We have witnessed that those were the scenes and the opposition when Whitfield and others preached and Whitfield was often assaulted and had stones and other things thrown at him. So that's Whitfield, one of the key figures who was convulsing London and other parts of the country with his preaching and his conviction that God was not known or placated through our doing our best, but by our receiving his mercy and love through faith alone. Another man who came to this understanding was a very well-known John Wesley. Here's a picture of Wesley preaching in America in 1737. Wesley had two years in America, and by his admission, they were a disaster. He managed to offend, alienate, wind up almost everybody he came in, into contact with. He said gloomily, I went to America to convert the Native Americans and realized that I was not converted. He had an experience, a conversion experience the following year, 1738, in London and instantly took to preaching his new message in churches where they would have him and on the streets and in the fields if they, the churches wouldn't. So, George Whitfield, John Wesley. Back to Henry Venn. Venn left Cambridge and took up a curacy in a small village in Surrey in 1715. He shared those duties with preaching in London churches as well. He was a conscientious clergyman and his parishioners loved him. Four years later, he was back in London in Clapham. At that point, an attractive village just south of the river. And in Clapham, four very important things happened. Firstly, he came to know Whitfield and Wesley, others who were identified as evangelicals, gospel people or Methodists, which was a term of reproach. Those who are particular, methodical about their Christianity and their Christian living. And then was groping his way towards the same sort of peace and joy which he saw in these men. Secondly, he came to know John Thornton. John Thornton was one of the wealthiest businessmen in Europe. They began a lifelong friendship through which Thornton often came to Venn's financial aid and helped Venn in supplying the needs of his parishioners. Thirdly, Venn came to meet and marry his then wife, Elling. Elling, uh, a strong-minded, fiery woman. One of Venn's clergyman friends said that Venn followed her meekly and obediently like a soldier would follow his commanding officer and Venn's friend was not impressed by that but he may have been right. Venn adored Elling and doted on her. The fourth thing which happened in Clapham was that Venn came to a confident understanding of the Christian message and an acceptance of it. I put up in our next picture the words as Venn would have read them in his Bible translation of the Apostle Paul's uh, letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, where Paul says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. And as Henry Venn came to understand and, and take hold of that message, it seemed to him to be the complete opposite of what he had heard and believed growing up. We're not saved by our good works to earn God's favour. We are saved to do God's works 
once we already enjoy God's favour, once we have received his grace and experience through Christ, salvation through faith. That salvation, insisted the apostle, is the gift of God, not, not, not the duty of man. It's God's gift. And that made Henry Venn a new man by his own admission. He'd entered into this new world of faith, assurance, joy and conviction. But he wanted to handle his new convictions carefully, though passionately. There was a lot of mockery of the evangelicals and the Methodists. And William Hogarth joined the ranks of the mockers. If you'll look at the picture in front of you, entitled Enthusiasm Delineated. So much to see in this picture. I can only pick out just one or two things from it. But look at the preacher in the pulpit. He's not holding out the Bible or expounding the word of God. He's holding out superstition and magic. He's bewitching and fanaticizing the congregation as they swoon and gawp at him. And of all the many details which Hogarth has put in, look bottom right where there is a brain and behind it a thermometer and the temperature of the congregation is being ratcheted up and up by the preacher's ranting. And at the top of it is the word madness. He's making his hearers go mad. And that was a frequent charge against Methodists and evangelicals. When Henry Venn began preaching his new message at Clapham, he was not popular. And he and his wife and Ellen came to the same convictions they both experience hostility. There was only so much of this hostility that Venn felt that he could and wanted to take. And so he began searching around for a new charge. It was time for him to run his own parish. And through his network of friends, he was put into contact with John Ramsden, who owned the living of Huddersfield. That means he had the right to decide who the next vicar would be. And because the parish was vacant, and Ben's name was brought forward, Ramsden selected him. And in 1759, in the spring, Ben went ahead of his wife and their young family and installed himself into Huddersfield and she would follow on a few weeks later on. What sort of place was it that Ben came to? Well, in our next picture, you'll see some weaver's cottages. You might actually know this place in Golka. And of course, weaving the textile trade was the majority occupation for families and householders in the area. Wesley found them a wild bunch. Famously, in 1757, he wrote in his diary, rode over the mountains to Huddersfield, a wilder people I've never met in all England. And yet, Wesley was used to meeting wild people and he was used to finding a reception for himself and for his message in the out of the way parts of the UK, in large parishes with minimal clerical control and, and little uh, intervention from landowners. It's even in those places, particularly in the northeast, in Yorkshire, in the southwest amongst textile workers, tinners, Miners, the evangelical message particularly, seemed to gain a hearing and an acceptance. And I think Venn was well aware of that. And I think he looked at his parish with relish, wanting a slice of the action of the evangelical revival. It was an enormous parish, 10 miles east to west, 13,000 acres. The average parish in the south of England was about 2,500 acres. Venn's work was cut out. He came to a growing town. During his tenure, the canals were dug and key roads were built connecting the city to, uh, connecting the town to other areas. Population increased threefold between 1716 and 1778. Venn estimated that there were around 1,400 families in his parish. And when he preached his first sermon, fully 
3,000 people turned up to listen to this man and try to get a sense of this Londoner who had come up. So, of course, the parish church and Sundays were the, were the real center of Venn's activity. He loved his church's liturgy. He conducted the services in a solemn, reverential way, but he was full of human warmth and he couldn't abide poor singing. And he was a preacher, a man of conviction and passion. His preaching did not always make him popular, but he was highly personable and won many followers in his time. He estimated that 900 people professed Christian faith under his care. And he was hero worshipped by the young men and by the boys. A couple of boys would seek to hide after the morning service so that they'd be locked into the parish church. And they did that so that when the afternoon service came, they could have a seat at the steps of the pew. And large numbers from the parish were either shepherded towards training for Anglican ministry, or if they couldn't get into that training, they became dissenting ministers, independents, or even Baptists. So a popular man and loved in his parish. Then couldn't visit all the parish. It was simply too big. There were other chapels going down the Colne Valley where curates were placed and Venn had good relationships with his curates. Many of them he was friendly with for life. But if Venn couldn't get out and cover all of his parish, often the parish came to him. And we have eyewitness accounts of the passageway to his study in the busy vicarage being lined with people who would go to Venn to seek counsel about practical matters of Christian living, to bring their problems and their heartaches, to bring their spiritual anxiety to Venn. And the maid record very often they came from the study, tears running down their faces. The busy vicarage life was complemented by a large family and Venn and his wife had five children, four girls and a boy. Venn's generosity was uh, was well known people came to him with their financial needs one or two parishioners grumbled that he could be too easy to believe their stories but certainly he was known for giving generously of finan for financial relief sometimes of his own money and the money he'd asked for friends from friends one elderly parishioner said that he was a very liberal man he cared no more for money than i do for dirt so a busy man, but a man who wanted to widen the scope of his ministry beyond the town. In 1763, Venn published a book. His book was called The Complete Duty of Man. The edition I've photographed here comes from 1838, some 60 years after the book was published, which indicates its popularity. It went through successive uh, prints and the book was popular because it achieved what Venn wanted it to do to set out evangelical religion not as belonging to crazy enthusiasts but as the religion of the bible and of the articles of religion of the church of england he wanted to position evangelical faith as being believable practical and belonging to the nation's church and therefore to be believed and obeyed by the nation. It was an extremely important book in achieving the ends which Venn had for it. Venn made several other less well-known publications, but he put his preaching gifts also to a wider sphere. The lady in the picture here was even more formidable than she looks in the picture. And that was Lady Selina Hastings, Countess of Huntingdon, a member of the aristocracy. She lost her husband at a young age. She used the very many years of her long life and very much of her personal wealth to finance evangelical endeavor. She would buy chapels and place in them her, her favorite clergy so they might preach. She would buy buildings and repurpose them as chapels. Her particular burden was to bring the gospel message to the aristocracy so that they might hear evangelical religion 
for what it really was. Venn, it said, was one of the Countess's favourite preachers and he enjoyed her company and the company of like-minded men who preached with him and trips away to the fashionable towns of Bath and Bristol and trips to the capital to preach and have conversation with friends or highlights of Venn's year and equivalents of holidays. Now you can imagine as we look at another picture of Venn that this was an intense and a tiring life. Venn had already had health scares. He felt in Clapham the strain of work and had several months away from the parish. His chest problems reoccurred in Huddersfield and he had another lengthy spell recuperating. In 1767, tragedy struck when his wife Elling was diagnosed with cancer and the cancer claimed her life. Venn was devastated. He wrote a very feeling letter to a close friend in which he pours out his heart's agony at losing his very dear wife. As the next few years went on, he was exhausted, grieving, depressed, isolated, and still carrying out a very heavy round of ministerial responsibilities. He came to the conviction in 1770 that if he didn't leave the parish, the strain of parish life in such a large, busy area would kill him. He actually thought he was dying and he resolved to move away and take a smaller parish and perhaps live out his last months or year or two. And he moved, although his parishioners were shocked and some quite cross and few understood the strain upon their minister. They wanted him to stay but Venn was insistent and he went to Yelling in Huntingdonshire and I challenge you to find it on the map in front of you. It's not actually marked. That's why I've chosen this picture because it was the most out of the way little place. A parish of 2,000 acres, 200 simple farming souls directly south of Huntingdon and 10 miles due west of Cambridge. And when Venn got there, he clearly thought, what on earth have I done? He writes letters where he's trying to process the shock of the place and the atmosphere uh, and the few pews in the church building filled with a few parishioners who he said, stare at me like cows. But only a few months later, Venn was writing uh, animated letters to friends saying that the scenes of Huddersfield were coming to yelling in that the church was getting more and more crowded all around the region. He said people are talking about us and people were coming from 10 miles away and the church had two or three hundred people crowding in each Sunday. The message that Venn was preaching was taking hold and beginning to change the parish. But these were not spectacular years. As middle age came upon Venn and as the years went on, he discovered that actually he had far more strength than he ever thought he would. And he had 25 years fully in the parish, bringing up his children, obsessing and fussing over his son's careers. He went to Cambridge University and then had a curacy with Venn and then one in Norfolk. And using the time with a smaller burden of pastoral care to write letters. And here's a picture of a volume of Henry Venn's letters with a lovely picture of Castle Hill. There's a good selection of the 500 or so archive letters, which his son and then grandson selected and took to publication, in which they showcase the heart and the priorities and the labours of a conscientious Christian minister. Venn said to a friend in one of those letters, my talent seems to be for conversation and intimacy. And it was, he was a trusted and much loved friend to many people in the parish, back in Yorkshire where he kept lifelong friendships and around the evangelical scene. He was comfortable with the poor and the struggling, but moved comfortably amongst the gentry and the well-to-do as well. 
What of his descendants? Well, here's a picture of John, his son. We're going to return to John, though we'll keep the picture up. But it might be interesting just to note that from Henry Venn came a long line of illustrious descendants, including a line of Cambridge academics well into the middle of the 20th century. And they included Venn's great grandson, the brilliant mathematician John Venn of Venn diagrams fame. Henry Venn was also the great great grandfather of the writer Virginia Woolf, who was at the heart of the Bloomsbury group, which was, as you may well know, a group of free thinking artists, critics and writers who did much to shape uh, the cultural climate of the later Victorian period. But coming back to John, many of the members of that circle had actually their own ancestry in an earlier movement which John presided over as the vicar of Holy Trinity Church in Clapham where he went in 1792 and that group was known as the Clapham sect, a group of like-minded men and their families who shared Venn's evangelical religion and who were determined to use and express that religion in order to shape the moral fiber of British society. Venn, in his bachelor days, shared lodgings with a Cambridge man who became a great friend of his, William Wilberforce. And here's a picture of Wilberforce. Wilberforce, uh, one of the most famous Yorkshiremen from Hull, uh, a gentleman was just enjoying life. Uh, but then through the persistent witness and friendship of a Cambridge academic, came to embrace evangelical religion to the horror of some of his friends in 1786. Little more than a year later, he famously wrote in his diary, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. Wilberforce worked alongside many like-minded evangelicals, but many others as well, to petition for the suppression of the slave trade. And the slave trade was abolished in the British colonies through their efforts in 1807. And then two days before Wilberforce's death in 1833, the owning of slaves was itself outlawed. The movement for abolition had been successful. The Reformation of Manners was Whitfield, Wilberforce's other great project, and he worked tirelessly to found associations and organisations and to push for the implementation of laws, all of them to safeguard and improve the conditions of the more vulnerable in society, workers, children, women, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals owes its origin explicitly to Wilberforce's efforts. He and his fellow evangelicals had every conviction that their faith must pass into action, that they must be, in the words of Christ, salt and light, that their calling was to use their gifts, their privileges to help people in their country and even beyond know freedom and have opportunity to live well and of course opportunity to hear the same evangelical faith. So as we come to a close and we think about Venn's legacy and let's have in front of us this picture of now a very elderly Henry Venn. I think if Venn were to look back and think well what was his legacy he would see it in the efforts of the Clapham sect. He would see it in the generations of young men at Cambridge University, some of whom went out to Yelling to sit at his feet and learn ministry from him. He was a principled churchman who never wanted his religion to thrive outside the Church of England if it could thrive within it. 
because it was the church's creed, Venn insisted. So he gave himself tirelessly to building up the church, but he believed deeply in serving the poor, regardless of their faith, in bringing the love of Christ to them. And in the efforts of the Clapham sect and other great 19th century movements of Christian philanthropy, he would have been well satisfied. Venn had a stroke about two years before the end of his life, and that really signaled the closure of his ministry in Yelling. He and his unmarried daughter Jane went to live with John and their family in Clapham, and Venn sought out his last year there, delighting in being in having the family all around him uh, and dying. We have uh, we have an account filled with joy, confidence that he was accepted by God and knowing that the evangelical deposit he had given to his son and to so many others was in good hands and would go forward in the church and in the land. I'm closing with a short quotation from a sermon which Venn preached in Clapham in 1759. See how his life had turned, in a sense, in full circle as he came back to end his life in Clapham. But back in 1759, as he had recently embraced evangelical religion, we, we meet him in a moment where he's speaking to those in his congregations who were Christian believers who were confident of their salvation by grace through faith in Christ and who knew the calling to lead a transformed life. And he says to them these words, fired with active gratitude and love unfeigned, your soul will magnify the Lord by every expression of dutiful subjection and your soul will rejoice in God, your saviour. And that's the essence of Venn's life and his labours, a joyful Christian experience, a gratitude to God, a transparent love for God and fellow man, and a conscientious duty in expressing that love in kind words and in good works. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rose. This has been the last of our talks for 2021. The season will resume next year in February. By then, we hope to be able to meet face to face, but exactly how and where remains uncertain. We are conscious that these online talks have been enjoyed by many people who will not be able to attend our members' meetings in person. So what we hope to be able to do is to record them and make them available again online. Because of COVID, the situation keeps changing. Please keep visiting our website, where we will try to keep you up to date. For now, our thanks once again to Lewis. Our very best wishes to you for Christmas and the New Year. And thanks to you all for joining us. Goodbye for now. We hope to see you in 20. 22.